you may be seated. Let us pray. To the source of all being that lies within our hearts, we, expect, we express our deepest appreciation for the good men and women who have worked throughout the years since the inception of the Tucker Foundation of Dartmouth College to this moment. They have sought to do goodness and justice in our world. They have served generations of Dartmouth students toiling to show and to provide for them a way to repair that which was broken and to restore that which has been torn down. We thank you for the blessing of leadership that the Tucker Foundation has been provided since its founding unto this moment. These leaders have toiled to show our students how to alleviate human suffering so that your vision of a beautiful world could be realized. For all these gifts, we give thanks unto you the source of our being. Today we begin a new chapter at the Tucker Foundation. You have brought us a man who reflects an outer calm from a spirit that is pure and whole. You have bestowed upon us a man who will lead us through the turbulence that lies ahead. He is a man of great faith, a faith that has been tested in the spirit and tradition of a Job, and yet he has remained firm, solid, and true, even in the worst of times. He is a quiet man, and all who have worked with him know the purity of his soul. We petition that you continue to lie deep within his heart and within his soul in the days and months and years that lie ahead. We ask that you give us the wisdom to seek his guidance and to follow his heart and to help us fulfill his vision. For we know he seeks only to do righteous and to do just and to do that which is right in your eyes. Let us heed the words of the prophet Micah, who reflects the essential spirit of the Tucker Foundation of Dartmouth College. Higid lecha adam matov uma adonai doresh mincha ki ima sot mishpat v'yavat chesed v'hatsnea lechet im elohecha. Humankind, it has been told unto you what is good and what it is that God searches to find within you. It is only to do justice, to fully embrace the spirit of loving kindness, and to be humble in walking with your God. In the words of the psalmist, may the eternal source of all being establish the work of our hands, establish the work of our hands firmly, and let us say, Amen. Recitation of the Quran is an art whose conventions have been passed down since the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I will read a translation of the first chapter of the Quran and then recite the original Arabic text in the traditional manner. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, praise be to God, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds, most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment, Thee do we worship, and thine aid we seek. Show us the straight way. The way of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy grace, those whose portion is not wrath, and who go, go not astray. Amen. Bismillahi rahmani rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahmani rahim maliki yawmiddin. 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط مستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير مغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين
Who was William Jewett Tucker? Who was William Jewett Tucker? The William Jewett Tucker Foundation was founded in 1952 in memory of Dartmouth's last preacher president, a transformative leader at Dartmouth in the years from 1893 to 1909. Born in 1839 <clears throat> and graduated from Dartmouth in, eight, in 1861, William Jewett Tucker is universally recognized as the president who saved Dartmouth from the fate of becoming a tiny, sleepy provincial college. Through an ambitious program of building facilities, strengthening the faculty, and expanding the student body, he made the college more viable both financially and educationally. He transformed the curriculum, enlarged the college's vision of itself, and inspired his trustees. In his autobiography, Tucker remarked that one of his most significant accomplishments at Dartmouth was building dormitories connected by a central heating system that allowed students to take frequent hot baths. <laughs> a fact, he said, that revolutionized student life. He presided over daily chapel and was famous for the addresses he gave in the Sunday evening chapel services. Trained as a congregational minister, Tucker came to Dartmouth after having first been a professor at Andover Seminary, where he had been among a group of professors who had been tried and acquitted of heresy. Tucker represented the forces of modernization that helped to keep Dartmouth alive and flourishing. 26 years after his death in 1926, when there were no longer many active clergy serving on its faculty, the foundation that was to be his monument was established to continue the moral and spiritual work to which he had devoted his life. The Minutes of the Creation of the William Jewett Tucker Foundation. A special meeting of the trustees of Dartmouth College was held in their room in the Parkhurst Administration Building, Hanover, New Hampshire, on the 16th day of June, 1951, at 11 o'clock in the morning, agreeably to an announcement at a regularly called meeting on the preceding day. There were present the President, His Excellency Sherman Adams, Governor of New Hampshire, and Mr. Cutter, Guile, Hood, Orr, and Room. The president called the attention of the Board of Trustees to the fact that this special meeting is being held for the particular purpose of considering means for advancing the moral and spiritual work of Dartmouth College. He recalled to the board that Dartmouth College was founded by Eliezer Wheelock, whose creative religious faith and missionary zeal for the education of Indian youth expanded to embrace all young men. 
This moral and spiritual purpose has carried through the years of nearly two centuries. Never has it been set aside, however much changing conditions have caused the means for its accomplishment to be modified. This moral and spiritual purpose springs from a belief in the existence of good and evil, from faith in the ability of men to choose between them, and from a sense of duty to advance the good. Eliezer Wheelock suggested the words vox clamantes in deserto for the motto of Dartmouth College. This motto continually reminds us of the founder's deep concern for the advancement of spiritual purposes. The concept of spiritual values is broader than that of religious observances. William Jewett Tucker's administration bridged the generation for which the older and more rigid religious concepts still had the, held their values and the generation which followed. Liberal in his own views, he was endowed with a positive nature which protected him from the weaknesses of liberalism. He gave meaning to religious and moral issues as few men have been able to do. The name of William Jewett Tucker stands as a symbol of the spiritual life of Dartmouth College. Half a century ago, he expressed the ideals of the college, the ideals of its beginning, of its todays, of its tomorrow. The president, having concluded his statement, the trustees of Dartmouth College, desiring to assure that these moral and spiritual traditions shall ever pervade the life and work at Dartmouth, of Dartmouth, and finding in the life and leadership of William Jewett Tucker, ninth president of Dartmouth College, the reality of the mission of the liberal college. Therefore vote to establish the William Jewett Tucker Foundation for the purpose of supporting and furthering the moral and spiritual work and influence of Dartmouth College, adopted unanimously. Uh, good afternoon. So what does Tucker look like today? Um, when Dean Crocker asked me to talk about this, I thought it would be an easy enough task, but I began to think about it and to percolate, and it became clear that if you would ask 10 people what the Tucker Foundation is to them, they might give you 10 different answers. So how can I accurately paint to you a picture of what Tucker looks like today? Well, let's start with the basics. The Tucker Foundation today has two key components. First, religious and spiritual life, and also service and education. These two areas of Tucker are not mutually exclusive. Rather, students are invited to find the connections between the two, to make their own connections, and in so doing, to seek intellectual growth and character development. Today, there are 18 wonderful men and women who work at Tucker and also Hillel, and there are nearly 30 students who work at Tucker as student directors or civic interns. Last year, about 4,500 students participated in some sort of activity at Tucker. And by my own guess, nearly all students interact with Tucker in some way during their time at Dartmouth. But back to those 10 people. I'd like to elaborate on what Tucker is to them. One might tell you that for them, Tucker is where they've been able to explore their faith to explore other faiths, to explore religion, and to ask the big questions that we don't answer in the classroom. On the Multi-Faith Council, students find support for this exploration, as well as a diverse and close-knit community. All members partake in engaging dialogue about faith at Dartmouth. This is what Tucker looks like. Another person might live in the Upper Valley with her children, and they're mentored by Tucker volunteers in Big Brother, Big Sister. Her home was made ready for this winter by volunteers from the Dartmouth Greek system, and this was made possible by the Tucker Foundation. Mentoring and warm homes, this too is what Tucker looks like. Next, you might meet one of the Tucker volunteers who is a mentor to local children through the DREAM program, which meets on Friday afternoons throughout the term. She just came back from a trip to New York City with the older kids chaos, counting to see if everyone is there, exhaustion, hugs, and tremendous reward is what Tucker looks like. Among those 10 might also be students actively fundraising for their spring break trip to the Dominican Republic. 
Today, Tucker sends students to the Gulf Coast, to Kentucky, to Florida, to South Dakota, to San Francisco, and to Nicaragua on service trips. Building community, real building homes, new culture and understanding, learning, challenge, and bonding. This is what Tucker looks like today. And of course, there's my own story. I volunteered at an elementary school in Vermont twice a week during my first two years at Dartmouth. I also spent one term in Kenya as a Tucker Fellow, becoming part of the community of Kibera. I learned how to cook for an entire orphanage, how to teach in Swahili, and I realized that we don't need to speak the same language to understand each other. That's what Tucker looks like to me. But see, now we've only met five of these 10 people, and already I've painted for you a rich mosaic that is constantly expanding and shifting form. For me, Tucker is a source of tremendous personal growth, and for others, it is the same. It is a foundation that supports learning more about ourselves and more about each other. And maybe this all sounds very cliche. I'm okay with that, because what Tucker looks like today cannot be conveyed with just words. In our seminar room on the first floor of the foundation is Tucker's mission statement, but next to it is something more important. It says, William Jewett Tucker Foundation, nurturing the heart and soul of Dartmouth College. I think this is the best way to explain what Tucker looks like today. I know that I speak for a lot of Dartmouth students when I say that Dartmouth can be hard, it can be rough and really cold, but sometimes we just wanna go home to the warmth, right? But there are parts of Dartmouth that soften the challenges, that bring us back year after year, and that warm us up. Maybe it's just a feeling that we can't really describe. But for more students than I can count, Tucker is that feeling and that place, nurturing our hearts and souls, but also it is home. Over the past 50 plus years, some 11 individuals have previously held the title of Dean of the Tucker Foundation, either on a permanent or an interim basis. And we're delighted that today, several of those individuals are here with us. Fred Berthold, Charles Dye, 
Robert Binswanger, Jan Targen, Scott Brown, and Stuart Lord. I'd ask you to just stand for a moment, moment so you can be recognized. Today's address, entitled Honest Work, will now be given by the Reverend Professor Peter Gomes, who has served as minister in Harvard University's Memorial Church since 1970. He is a plumber professor of Christian morals at Harvard and is known as one of this country's most distinguished preachers. One could say much about his various honors and accomplishments, but now I will only note one small detail, that he is a graduate of Bates College where he has served as trustee and that fact is of special import for today's occasion because in 1978, he presided over Richard Crocker's installation as chaplain at Bates College. Please join me in welcoming Peter Gomes. was a very happy day in the chapel of Bates College some years ago when I was able to take part in rites not altogether dissimilar to this by which we installed Richard Crocker as our chaplain. I can therefore testify that he is well prepared to take on whatever Dartmouth can throw at him. It is a small college, but there are those who love it. <laughs> it always pleases me that that has never been used as an excuse by Dartmouth to think in small, parochial, or provincial ways. Located where you are, you could be forgiven for being provincial, <laughs> parochial, and small, but you have never acted that way. <laughs> Sometimes to the annoyance of your older sisters and brothers in Cambridge. But the fact of the matter is this. In the William Jewett Tucker Foundation, you created long ago something quite unique, something quite novel. You actually confessed that you cared about the souls as well as the minds of your undergraduates, and you devoted resources to carry out that care in the person of the dean of the Tucker Foundation. Very shortly, the provost will install the dean, and I read with great care what is said. I don't believe a word of it. I don't believe, I don't mean that Dartmouth College is lying or that the provost intentionally deceives by the words he soon will utter, but no human being can possibly do all that's expected, all that's required, all that's averred in these words of installation. So it must mean that this is a text of aspiration something to which one aspires, and may very well be the useful role of those previous deans of the Tucker Foundation who have just stood to prove how little or how much of that can be done. As I look out at this marvelous congregation, I am much encouraged. When I arrived about an hour ago, of course, the place was empty and cold. And I wondered if anybody would turn out to help poor old Richard do what you've called him to do. <laughs> but now the place is full. I don't know who you are, but I hope you have some connection with this college, some connection with this foundation, and most importantly, some connection with its new dean, so that you will not leave him comfortless that his will not be the only voice crying out in the wilderness, <laughs> that some of you actually will turn up again 
and be helpful to him, kind and generous hearted, offering him the right hand of fellowship and sharing with him in what must often be difficult labors in this place for the souls and minds of Dartmouth College. Now there has been some speculation as to the nature of my dress, as well as some speculation as to its length. <laughs> I hasten to say that it will end when it ends. <laughs> but let me tell you a little bit about the title, uh, where it came from. It was one of those odd father-son intended to be bonding moments. And I was a young boy, I was about 12 years old. My father and I were hoeing in the garden. And I had one of those transcendental moments about which we read and sometimes write. And I looked at my father and I said, Daddy, I think I want to be a minister. The heavens should have stopped, the violins should have begun to play, and the earth should have shook, but it didn't. My father stopped, looked in the middle distance, and then roused himself to say to me, his only son, I had always hoped that my boy would do honest work. Now, I may have been naive, but I was not stupid. I knew exactly what my father meant. And I think I have tried to spend the last 40 years proving to him on the other side of the grave that I was engaged in honest work, that this is honest work. And it is to the subject of honest work that I wish to commend my brother today who is soon to become dean of this foundation. Honest work, heart, mind, and body engaged in a transformational activity. Well, that is what you have here. I have no idea what the president of Dartmouth is supposed to do, and I rarely would speculate on what provosts and professors and deans do but the dean of the William Jewett Tucker Foundation is apparently responsible for all good things <laughs> at Dartmouth. It may not always be honest work, but it will always be hard work. And he can't do it by himself. And so to give him a little help, as most preachers do, I have taken a text. Now, one of my predecessors at Harvard was fond of saying, the American penchant for preachers taking a text should go like this. Take your text, depart from your text, never return to your text. <laughs> I intend to take my text and I shall return to it. My text is that wonderful verse of St. Paul's in the 12th chapter of Romans, which begins, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is what St. Paul says in the 12th chapter of Romans, and it is that upon which I wish to base these remarks today. Now I am here, I trust, in large part because I am an unashamed, out and confessing friend of Richard Crocker. I don't pretend to objectivity. I've known him for a long time. I admire, I even love him. 
But I'm also here, I think, because I've been in this business a long time. I am the senior Ivy League chaplain. I've been doing this stuff more or less since 1970. As my friends in Cambridge say, you know where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> of course I do, I've buried most of them. <laughs> I have a few more to go <laughs> before I retire. So I have some sense of the nature of the work you have called Richard to do. And I know that with all the charm and the goodwill notwithstanding, it is virtually an impossible job. I was gratified by the young woman who tried to describe the Tucker Foundation. It appears that there are as many definitions as there are people to give them. It means it can always please somebody, but it also means it can always annoy somebody either by what it fails to do or by what it attempts to do. There is an excuse to say that's what the Tucker Foundation does. Or you can also say that bloody Tucker Foundation sticking its nose in someplace else where it doesn't belong. And to put a person in charge of that kind of enterprise, you may think you're doing Richard a favor. It is he who does you the favor. And don't you ever forget it. A college is a strange place. I know how strange they can be. I'm a Bates man. I have spent nearly 40 years in Harvard College. I am not entirely unfamiliar with the peculiar ways of Dartmouth College. A college is a strange place because it is full of expectations, it is full of certainties, it is full of uncertainties, and it is full of disappointments. President Eliot of Harvard, who had reigned for 40 years, a carefully chosen word, was once asked, were there any disappointments or frustrations in his long tenure as president of America's oldest college. He said, oh yes, from time to time I run into them in the college yard of a, gay, of a daily walk. <laughs> Many of those disappointments, I assume, are nearby. Some may be even in this chapel, even as I speak. Doubtless you will run into them, Richard, they will lay before you the impossibility of your job and the presumption you show in trying to take it on. That goes in the nature of the place. Then there will be people who will come to you, maybe some here, with enormous expectations. You will take this incredible raw material that is admitted each year by the mysteries of the admissions office and you will turn them into something they can't possibly become. Nice, civil, decent, smart, able, competent, compassionate people. You could try, that's what they pay you for, but you won't always succeed. There will still be notorious failures, people vividly immune to the high ideals of Dartmouth College and of this foundation and you'll just have to go on. You'll just have to chalk them up. Or as my mother used to say, you'll have to leave them to the dust and let the rain settle them. But you can't stop. You must go on. A college is a strange place, and that is why if they're out of it, there should be a strange thing like this foundation, and an even stranger thing like this building. I love the fact that Eliezer Wheelock knew enough to choose the right verse to be a motto for your college. When I came in, I thought that was he over there in that window. It turns out to be Moses. Must be 
one and the same, I suppose. But a voice crying in the wilderness. What a great concept. And what a dangerous conceit. Yours will be a part of that voice. A voice in the void of values. When nobody knows quite what it's supposed to be to be an educated man or woman nowadays. When anything will do and anybody will do it. That is the modern college. I had a very distinguished economist who for a time attempted to run our college in Cambridge speak to me, which he didn't often do, but one day he said to me, what do you humanists do? It was a hostile question. <laughs> I understood that, and you'll get many of those, Richard. What do you humanists do? And I said to him, sir, we humanists introduce people to books and ideas that explain the world and how people behave when your books and ideas are proven to be false. <laughs> now, Richard, you could only say that if you have tenure. <laughs> and I... <laughs> And that was before the collapse of Wall Street civilization. And to think that man's in charge, partial charge of our economy. God help us, deliver us from economists. You will do more for the welfare of the nation and the well-being of these young people by what this foundation is meant to do. And all of the charts and all of the logarithms and all of the other stuff that the hard science people think they are purveying out there. One of the advantages of having a preacher from afar is that the preacher from afar can say outrageous things. I could offend everybody. You're not paying me enough. You can't fire me and I'm out of here in an hour and a half. <laughs> I will say the things that maybe Richard thinks, but it's probably too charitable to say. The Tucker Foundation must not be thought of as a Dartmouth hors d'oeuvre. It must not be thought of as something extra and so precious and special. It must be thought of as something central and essential to the heart and the integrity of this institution. And it will be for the need to make it so. I have a bit of advice for you, Richard, based on long experience. Don't wait to be invited to things. Up here. <laughs> the president will be surprised to see you. <laughs> but up here. The deans will be surprised to see you, but they'll be too polite to tell you to go away. <laughs> go to meetings where you haven't been invited. Stick your oar in. Don't wait for them to send for you, because they never will, of course. They don't want to trouble you. They think you'll be about your prayers and your devotions, which I'm sure you will be. <laughs> but go. Don't wait to be invited into the councils of the mighty. For the mighty will have no room for you, and they won't miss you if you don't show up. But they'll know if you do and what you will learn from that, but more importantly, what they will learn from your presence there. I'm urging you, Richard, to be a meddlesome, militant, interfering presence. I want them to know you're here. So when they fire you, they will have a good reason to do so. <laughs> but they won't dare because you will have a purchase on the very essence of the place. And nothing gets better than that. You will be a voice crying in the wilderness. You will be a voice for conscience over convenience. 
you will be a voice for faith against the tyranny of fact. And that is honest and hard work. But this foundation, as best I understand it, represents those ancient values unique to all the great religious traditions of the world. And what are those values? Caring for the sick, the infirm, the elderly, the poor, and the vulnerable. Practicing mercy, charity, and goodwill. Fostering generosity, humility, and honesty and raising communal concern over individual egotism. If you want a job description, that's it. That's what those of us in this religion biz do. Now here at Dartmouth, I know you work very hard to elide the word religion from the William Jewett Tucker Foundation. You want to build up the body, you want to do all these other things, but I've passed your documents fairly carefully. It seems to me beneath the surface there is a fundamental religious concern. You can help affirm that, not only in yourself, but in your colleagues who seem to have a vague hint that you are a man of prayer, that you're a man of piety, and that you trust the spirit to give you guidance and utterance. My guess is that the more of that that you do here in Dartmouth College, the better off your students will be. Someone referred to this as a cold place. Well, you are at the back of beyond. You have a reason to be cold. But I don't think they were referring just to the weather. I think they were referring to the absence of soul. Maybe it's in the job description of the Dean of the Tucker Foundation to breathe a little soul into this place, to warm these cold hearts of yours, and to allow you to warm one another. I should think that that's a critical part of the enterprise, and a critical part of providing a foundation for the foundation. A foundation that just floats is nothing. A foundation has to be grounded in something. And to ground this in the spiritual and religious values which have given you strength and utterance and of which you are an articulate spokesman, it strikes me that that's the task. Now, dear Richard, I don't know where they found you or how they found you. Now, I don't know if it was a wise trustee, a prescient president, a clever search committee, some kid. I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> but they did. They were led to you. And because they were led to you, I have every reason to believe they are willing to be led by that which leads you. So I think you should be a good preach it to this community. Give them sermons. I think you should pray for this community. Let them know that that's what you're doing. And above all, I think you should demonstrate to this community the joy of faith. There's nothing better, friends, the joy of faith. Have you ever looked around at a room of academics? They all tend to look like this. They're all concerned, anxious, tolerant, but anxious, <laughs> worried, just, but worried. And there's very little joy, very little happiness, very little gladness. I suspect people think that it's less than scholarly to be glad about anything, less than academically respectable to have any enthusiasm. There are probably members of the English dot department here at Dartmouth who will remember that the root of the word enthusiasm is insanity. <laughs> so nobody here wants to show to anybody else that they're crazy or insane. That here in this deep freeze, honest, 
Ah, sober work goes on. I'm sure it does. And good for you. But you deserve more than that. And you need more than that. And that's what this foundation can do for you. And that, Richard, is what you can do for this foundation. The joy of faith, which I know is frightening, but it's also transforming. William Jewett Tucker, I gather, is or was the last clergyman, I hasten to say, so far, of Dartmouth College. I hate to think the day is inconceivable that there would ever be a professed man of faith or woman of faith as president of this college. Stranger things have happened, <laughs> my friends. And that day is yet to come. But until there is such a person, it's false to you, Richard. False to you to take all of this on, to articulate the hopes, the fears, and indeed the spiritual ambitions of a community like this. It's not all wood carving and snowmen. You know that. And the rest of you should if you don't. There is something to be said for cultivating a life of the spirit that will energize the life of the mind. Remember, St. Paul tells us that we should be transformed, changed from what we are to what we can become. That's the job description of the Dean of the Tucker Foundation, to be an agent of transformation and change. If you have hoped for things to carry on as they always have at Dartmouth, I believe you've chosen the wrong man. And you'll find out soon enough that transformation is at the heart of what this is. But the other word that is there in that text, Richard, which you will recognize as a student of the New Testament, is a strong injunction against conforming to this world. Dartmouth, like most colleges, despite its professions to the contrary, is a community of conformity. Everybody wants to be regarded, more or less, in the same category as everybody else. In Cambridge, for example, I have noticed that whenever there's a revolution, all the revolutionaries look alike. You ever notice that? They dress alike, they talk alike, they read the same things. Terrible conformists they are. You must not allow yourself to conform to whatever the prevailing template of this place may be. Break out from the pack and encourage others to break out from the pack and see what happens. Maybe there's an isolated professor here who is yearning to break out, doesn't know how. A conversation with you might make a difference. There may be a whole group of kids here who love Dartmouth in principle but hate the stifling effect it may have upon who they are or who they aspire to be. A word with you might make a difference. Transformation and nonconformity. Those I know are not household words at Dartmouth. Neither were they at Bates, neither are they at Harvard. But they are the thing that will make the difference in a ministry which is engaged in the nurturing of the hearts and the minds and the souls of this community of yours. So if you love this place, and I wouldn't work here if I didn't love it. If you find you don't love it, Richard, get out. There are plenty of other places. If you love this place, you'll give it everything you've got. And in giving it everything you've got, you'll be surprised at how much you get from these people. It will be a wonderful encounter. But it depends on you. You can't just sit there on the side and say, here's another deed of the Tucker Foundation. Let's see how long he'll last. <laughs> I notice that the tenure of these deans is not very long. I wonder what it could possibly be. 
You have got to help him. You've got to be part of his transformation. You have got to be part of this nonconformity. And if you care for Dartmouth College, you'll give it every shot you have. Now, if you're in the local church, the local church cannot afford to say, ha ha, Dartmouth, to hell with you. You don't want to say that. This is not to say that you do. Many do, though. You want to wish them well. Pray for her pastor. Pray for her people. If you're a part of a religious community at Dartmouth, which may not be under the orbit of the chapel or the chaplain or the dean, it's in your interest to wish him well. Because the whole place will flourish as a result of this kind of spiritual unity to which you all are called, not just a few. And my hope is that you won't fail in recognizing your duty to be a part of this great ministry of transformation, nonconformity, and reconciliation. Great things have happened here. Great things can happen here. The wonderful thing about the origins of this foundation was that it assumed that great things would happen here in the future. No one took those words of Daniel Webster as a mere description of the nature forever of Dartmouth College. It is a small college, but there are those who love it. Of course that's true. But it's more than that. And this foundation at its heart is meant to signify just how much more there is to it than that. If you remember any of this, you will have remembered all that is necessary to effect a transformation of life in this quite remarkable place. And I will say to you that nothing more than that is necessary. But I will also say to you, nothing less than that will do. It is honest work. It's also hard work. And ultimately, dare I say it, it is God's work. Who does Dartmouth think it is that it can function without God? You cannot. You will not. You must not. Let us hope that in your new deed, and in your new relationship, you will have discovered once again what it truly means to be a voice crying in the wilderness, crying against all the indifference that surrounds us, all the hostility that's out there, all the bad news that the chicken littles of this world are giving us morning, noon, and night. You will discover that there is more to life, more to faith, more to Dartmouth than any of that. And we can all say, thank God we were there when it began. Bless you, Richard, and bless Dartmouth College. Amen. On a daily basis, we are reminded of the value of the mission of the Tucker Foundation to educate Dartmouth students to think and act as ethical leaders and responsible citizens in the global community through service, character development, and spiritual exploration. This is no small task today. In this world where power often becomes its own purpose, where self-service trumps social service, and where wealth may be a substitute for wisdom. We recognize the importance of this mission. Dartmouth needs the Tucker Foundation, and the country and the world needs Dartmouth 
to support the Tucker Foundation. As we strive to educate the whole student at Dartmouth, the Tucker Foundation strives to provide transformational experiences for students, sometimes by traveling to a remote part of the world to serve, other times by reaching out to an Upper Valley neighbor, and for some by discovering their own spiritual side. To lead an organization that seeks to be the spiritual and ethical nexus of the campus requires a person of great character with a commitment to service, to self-reflection, and to moral leadership. It is my honor today to install formally Richard Crocker in a, posi in a position of the Virginia Rice Kelsey Dean of the William Jewett Tucker Foundation. Your charge is to advocate, promote, and exemplify the moral and spiritual concerns of Dartmouth College. We expect you to lead by example, to speak out when needed, and to model for us how to respect the convictions of others. We want you to challenge us as individuals and as a community, to encourage us to engage in demanding discussions, and to help us embrace difficult issues. While you are the leader of this effort, you do not carry this responsibility alone. We expect you to remind us that we all share the responsibility for creating a more ethical world. I am pleased that you have accepted this charge and have begun to embrace this important work. We promise you our support in these efforts. Richard Randolph Crocker, pastor, colleague, and friend. You stand as I have and as so many others have in the succession of those who have been set apart. And so let us hear these words from the Liturgy of Installation with Congregational Heritage, the same heritage shared by Dean Tucker himself. We urge you, our brother, warn the idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with all. See that no one pays back wrong for wrong, but at all times make it your aim to do good to one another and to all people. Be joyful always, pray at all times, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is what God wants of you in your life in the spirit. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and God of wonder, we thank you that you have called forth from communities of faith and learning, individuals who seek to serve you by serving the spiritual well-being, the moral center, the conscience, and the inclination toward justice and peace in all of your children. On this day of celebration, we pray in thanksgiving for your servant, Richard. You have called forth servants to make promises before you and before communities of faith. So now help us all to keep the vows that we have made, to remain steadfast in our faith and fruitful in every good work. We ask, O oh God, that you would enable all of us to surround Richard with our kindness, our support, our humor, our love, and our mutual passion for your word and your will, that our mutual ministry may be well served here in this institution. Grant us the spirit of power and of love, sound minds, clarity of hope, so that the ministry that you have given 
to us, entrusted into our hands, might be made holy and faithful and sure. Help Richard in all that he will do. Guide him always in your ways. Remind him that he is a servant, but he is also a husband and a father and an individual with individual needs, with a body that is sometimes tired. Help him to remember that though you are with him always, he will sometimes feel as if he stands alone. In those moments of isolation, remind him as well that your servants have always taken time alone, intentionally or because of their positions, their commitments, and their truths. O oh God, make us all doers, beers, lovers, hopeful people, so that we might at the last, by your grace, receive your blessing. Well done, thou faithful servant. Well done. Remind us, O oh God, always that we are yours, that you have entrusted into our care the life of institutions, the moral development of individuals, and the tenderness of your spirit. May we never fail you or one another in this most holy task. O oh God, be with Richard with his wife, Carolyn, with all of his colleagues at the Tucker Foundation and all of those friends and colleagues who support him close by and from a distance, that we might always be faithful to you in all we do. O oh God, glory and honor be yours forever. Amen.
must begin by expressing sincere thanks to many people, to each, each of you here today, whether you came from across the green or from a great distance, all of you came at the cost of giving up pre-Super Bowl festivities <laughs> to celebrate this occasion. I especially appreciate the presence of so many friends from various parts of my life, as well as the former deans of Tucker and the members of the Tucker Board of Visitors and several descendants of William Jewett Tucker. And of course, to my family, my wife Carolyn and sons Daniel and Stephen, who are here, and Jed, who would have liked to have been here, and to my daughter-in-law, Shelley. They deserve a great deal of credit, as they constantly remind me, <laughs> for putting up with me and for following me from Tennessee to Maine and back to Tennessee and back to Maine and then to Pennsylvania and then to New Jersey and now here. They make no secret of the fact that their favorite place was Lewiston, Maine. And they have never forgiven me for leaving Bates College, which why, it is why it is a special pleasure for me to have Peter with us today. Peter, if uh, the Dartmouth years are as good as the Bates ones, we will be blessed indeed. I also thank those who have arranged this occasion, the whole Tucker staff, and especially Ruth and Janet, as well as all the participants, the singers and speakers, and of course, Virginia Rice Kelsey, better known as Winky. She and Pete are away at the moment and could not be here, but I thank them for their generosity in endowing this position and for their foresight in making the endowment years ago so that the endowment is not underwater. Also, I thank the Presbytery of Northern New England, of the Presbyterian Church USA, under whose authority and oversight I am allowed to exercise ministry at Dartmouth, and which is represented here by several friends. People often tell me that I remind them of Garrison Keillor, <laughs> and I know that sometimes they mean it as a compliment. <laughs> <coughs> I take it as such to him. But don't worry, I will not break into song, though I believe I can sing about as well as he can. <laughs> and, and most of my stories are better, certainly shorter. My colleagues in the United Campus Ministry heard me say a couple of years ago, and now they hear me say it again, that in the midst of a snowstorm, a heavy snowstorm, I passed two ladies, citizens of Hanover, on the sidewalk in front of Collis Hall and overheard one of them remark, well, this is why we live here. And I thought to myself, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> and then I asked myself, well, why am I here? It didn't take me long to realize that I'm not here for the weather. I'm certainly not here for the skiing or for the scenery. I'm here as most of us are because Dartmouth is here. And Dartmouth is here only because Eliezer Wheelock came here and we have followed him. One of the benefits of my new job and my new office, by the way, Stuart, thanks for the furniture, <laughs> is that it has a window that allows me to gaze continually upon the grave of Eliezer Wheelock. <laughs> okay. William Jewett Tucker is buried in this cemetery as well, and when the snow melts, I'm going to find his grave. Now, this is not a funeral. It's rather a celebration of the continuing life of the Tucker Foundation. I really appreciated all of Peter's encouraging and challenging words, except this business about joy. <laughs> Some of you know that I teach a course on happiness in the writing department. 
when I announced that I was going to be teaching his course, my son Stephen, who's sitting there, said, Dad, are you qualified to teach that course? <laughs> One of his many remarks. <laughs> so it isn't a funeral, but I do feel, having listened to this, like a bit like Tom Sawyer, uh, having the joy of attending his own funeral. It's a celebration of the continuing life of Tucker. But the graves of Eliezer Wheelock and William Jewett Tucker remind me that our lives are brief. And by the grace of God and our own courage, we may either make them stand for something good or we may live them in the pursuit of things that do not matter. By the way, Super Bowl Sunday is always a cautionary holiday for me because it's a holiday supremely devoted to things that do not matter. And the Tucker Foundation's mission in its various aspects is to encourage students to think about things that matter and to act on them. So I'm here because Eliezer Wheelock made a long trek up the Connecticut River. He was a man with a mission, his mission of training clergy for Christian evangeliz evangelization with special attention to Native Americans has become controversial and somewhat problematic. It's not a mission that I can share explicitly, but I can take from President Wheelock and from President Tucker the conviction that life has a moral purpose and that our most important work is to realize and embody that moral purpose. I've been reading a book about John Ledyard, the early American explorer who entered Dartmouth in 1772 and, one of, and was one of Dartmouth's most, most famous non-graduates. He and Eliezer did not get along well. Indeed, Ledyard made himself a canoe and navigated all the way down the Connecticut River to Hartford, Connecticut, just before he was to be expelled from the college for, among other things, non-payment of his bill. Ledyard had already incurred President Wheelock's displeasure by submitting a petition that the college curriculum should allow time, I quote, for stepping the minuet and learning to use the sword. President Wheelock, in reaction, stated in his annual report for 1772, and I quote again, I have not heard a profane word spoken by one of my number, nor have I reason to think that there has been one for three years past. That is a record that probably would not stand now for three minutes. <laughs> we live in a very profane culture. The problem with a profane culture is that it discourages conversation about what is truly good and holy. Indeed, it sometimes mocks such conversation. One of the Tucker Foundation's jobs is to oppose profanity, not necessarily in the narrow sense that President Wheelock apparently did, but in the broader sense of supporting Dartmouth students as they search for the good and the true and holy in a culture that sometimes makes them think that there is no such thing. William Jewett Tucker was by all accounts a more appealing and warm figure than Eliezer Wheelock. His conception of religious commitment and social concerns were broad, but his commitment to moral and spiritual, to the moral and spiritual dimensions of education is quite firm. If the presidents of Dartmouth College constitute the Wheelock succession, then I would propose that the deans of the Tucker Foundation constitute the Tucker succession, or perhaps the, the Fred Bertold succession. And as I gaze out of my office window at the snowy cemetery where the bodies of both presidents rest, aware that we all will soon lie in a similar place, I vow to keep my trust with them. They are why I am here in this place, a place where, like Wobegon, like Lake Wobegon, for better or worse, all the children are definitely above average. And so we conclude, and so we begin. Thank you for being here today. After the hymn, please sit and enjoy listening to Chris Lundell's 
wonderful rendition of Vidor. Then come, if you can, to the reception at the Hayward Lounge in the Hanover Inn, which I am assured definitely will be better than average. We will spirit Peter Gomes away to the reception as quickly as we can, and you can greet him there. Carolyn and I will remain at the back of the chapel over here so that we can greet you for a few moments if we can greet any of you who cannot attend the reception. So, be blessed for having come. Be blessed in going. Be blessed in your conversations and in your silence. Be blessed in every moment of your life and be blessed in your death. Be blessed in all eternity. In the name of God, amen.